that we feel in looking at this. Okay, now I'm going to let you have it with a piece of genuinely atemporal expression. Right? It's on a Flickr set, which William Gibson sent me a link to. This is photoshopped by some Russian. This is St. Petersburg. Somebody's taken digital technology and fused two historical periods. Just turn them into a single visual artifact. And you can see they went to some trouble to kind of ghost it along the scene so you don't have like a clear division. I mean, it's an artistic statement, and they're intending to mess with us. I mean, they're deliberately giving us an atemporal frisson, right? I mean, the whole point of this image is to make us go, whoa, in an atemporal way. So, you know, is it the past that the present fused on, or is it the present with the past fused on, or is it an artifact which is both past and present and therefore atemporalized? And I would argue that, yeah, it's both. It's sort of both and neither. So now I ask you to consider what this image looks like in 100 years. Somebody prints it out, they put it in the attic, you pull it down. It's an atemporal object from 2005, only it's now 2095. Right? Where is it? Here's another one. This is made in the United States. I think this one hurts worse. Why does it hurt worse? <laughs> now, why is this more atemporal than that? You know, and I would argue that this is more atemporal than that. And I think it's the human element that makes it more atemporal. I think that sort of gives it the greater sense of disorientation. And also, perhaps it's the analog image sort of being digitally photographed, whereas this one just sort of has the smooth seamlessness of digital treatment. I mean, we're used to seeing digital special effects kind of Photoshop stuff. We're used to that. This one we're not really used to. And it's the author's hand in the image that I think really kind of messes with our heads. It's like he's done it manually. He's like manually broken history. And when there's tons of this stuff on Flickr, I had no idea it was there. Okay, this I'm not convinced is atemporal. And this is, of course, a Shakespeare play which has been reskinned for contemporary times. And Henry V is about a young man who's basically a playboy and a gadabout uh, who, uh, you know, is forced into a role of kingship and has to sort of put aside childish things and become an adult. So here's a poster in which Henry, instead of being what, you know, 13th century playboy is, you know, a contemporary millennial boozer frat boy kid, you know, with a cigar and a beer bottle. Okay, and I'm sure this entire piece is probably done in contemporary dress. You know, and that's not an unusual thing for Shakespeare. I mean, it's very common. It's been common for centuries for people to do Shakespeare in modern dress or even to do Shakespeare in not quite so modern dress, like say an 18th century version of Shakespeare. There was a recent production of Hamlet, which was a fascist Hamlet, in which sort of everybody's dressed in this kind of 1930s authoritarian gear. Okay, is that atemporal? I don't really think so. You know, it's more of a reskinning, and I think it's comparable to Shakespeare's own repurposing of Italian texts, where he just sort of like grabs some old-fashioned story and kind of reskins it himself. Uh, and, uh, you know, there, there are temporal anachronisms within Shakespeare, like the famous episode where Julius Caesar, in Julius Caesar, where people hear a clock striking. And of course, there were no clocks in the time of Caesar. And there's a kind of folk atemporality there, where people used to, painters, say, in the Baroque period, used to sort of draw, say, annunciation scenes of Jesus and Mary, and they're dressed instead of lace collars and brocade, you know, and just dressed as contemporary people, sort of because they knew no better, I think. So that's anachronism, and it's archaic, but that's not what I'm talking about. And I don't think this is quite what I'm talking about. This is much more what I'm talking about. 
this I really consider a temporality before the letter, right? Rome before Christ, after Fellini, at the same time. And here we have the quote from Federico, a great artist, pioneer, really. This picture will be science fiction, a trip back in time into an unknown dimension. Okay, it's science fiction, it's a trip back in time, and it's also into an unknown dimension, yeah. And it really does that. I mean, Satyricon, I think, is a very atemporal film. You know, it's kind of maybe the atemporal film. And what is that dimension that Fellini is describing there? Well, you know, it's a kind of creole space that's neither past nor future. And in some kinds of ways, it's a moral stance. You look at the Satyricon, you see he's like refusing to make moral judgments of Roman behavior. It's like the famous scene in Satyricon where a uh, comic is sort of farting in front of the audience and then has a guy's hand amputated in public and everybody has sort of a rich laugh about it, including the guy whose hand is chopped off. He starts sort of laughing hysterically. Okay, that's like a radical and in some sense science fictional interpretation of Roman times because he's just not letting us look away. He's sort of making us look at it in the same way that Romans would have looked at it. who really found it amusing and even sexy to see people butchered in public. So what can we do in the way of atemporality? Well, you know, Fellini's dead because he's mortal. And we're in, we are inexorably embedded in time as more mortal physical beings. We can't actually become a temporal. We can't age in reverse. I can't live in Rome. I can play mind games with this. I can behave as if I were not moored in time. And you know, what is the satyricon? I mean, is it an attempt to revive the past? Is it really a work of science fiction? The Satyricon itself, the book by Petronius Arbiter, is a work of fiction. It's not a history. It's a novel. It's actually kind of precursor of the novel, and it's in pieces. I mean, the Satyricon is a cultural artifact. If you're going to do a film of the Satyricon, you're into a different space than trying to do a film about ancient Rome. And I really wonder, you know, which is more like the Satyricon, Fellini's adaptation of the Satyricon, or like an archaeologist's scholarly study of the Satyricon, when you're really trying to describe what the Satyricon was in its context, which is more Satyricon-like? The Fellini movie adaptation of the Satyricon, or our attempt to sort of historically place the Satyricon? Which is more Satyriconically authentic? So, you know, I look at this and I know that Fellini is trying to shock us because he was big on that. And he was, he's really trying to do a science fictional thing, which is to blow our minds with the alienness of the past. But I wonder what would happen if you tried the opposite tack. Suppose you were not like Fellini and you didn't really like to trade on your shock the bourgeoisie elements. What would happen if you made a film set in the Roman Empire in which Everything was perfectly banal and familiar to us. I mean, only aspects were chosen of the Roman Empire that we're completely comfortable with. Right? Mothers nursing children, people singing in Latin, you know, kind of a harmless pastoral. Nothing shocked us, nothing excited us. I mean, what if you moved it completely? You know, you just, just tried to sort of methodically eliminate all the historical culture shock that exists between us and two millennia in the past. Would that be an atemporal film? Yeah, it would. I think it might be more atemporal than Fellini's film, which is really shocking. And the Satyricon is also quite shocking. I would, I would point out the, the book was written by Arbiter as an attempt to shock. It really is a satire. What if you were to do a film set in the remote past which had no science fictional element. It really went into the, the unknown dimension and there was sort of nothing surprising about it. It merely happened to be 2,000 years old. 